Coming up on DTNS, it's CES 2022. We've got robots, we've got TVs, we've got Patrick Norton to explain all this chip stuff from AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. DTNS's ninth year starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 4th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Hey, there's always a longer version of this show. If you like what you hear here, you can get more on Good Day Internet, available to patrons at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons in 2022, including Miss Music Teacher, GMC Smith, and Miranda Janelle. Let's start with a few tech things you should know, starting with a couple of non-CES things. The National Communications Authority of Ghana gave local ISP Celtel approval to invest $300 million into the Ghana Smart Cities project to provide national wireless internet coverage. Celtel plans to use technology in phones, workstations, and tablets manufactured by China's Haytech, a subsidiary of electronics conglomerate Hair, and routers and networking gear made by Cisco. Oh, U.S. and China. OnePlus will release its 10 Pro phone on January 11th, coming first to China. No word on pricing specs or availability outside of China. Founder Pete Lau said that the phone will use a unified OS, combining the Android-based Oxygen OS with Oppo's Color OS. AT&T and Verizon have agreed to comply with a request from the FAA and Transportation Department in the U.S. to delay rolling out their C-band 5G service on January 5th, tomorrow, by two more weeks. AT&T and Verizon originally planned to launch their C-band service on new frequencies back in December, but both the FAA and airplane manufacturers worried that the new frequencies are too close to those used by airplanes, radar, altimeters, which provide data on the distance between the plane and the ground and could potentially result in unsafe landings. And we have a Know a Little More episode at knowalittlemore.com where we actually talk to a pilot about this stuff if you want to understand a little more about that. All right, 11 CES quick hits coming at you. The 11 <laughs> hits of CES quickness. Starting with Select 2022's Samsung TVs will include a new gaming hub that will support Google Stadia, Utomic, and NVIDIA GeForce Now. Those are all game streaming apps. Stadia will work in 4K. GeForce Now will only be in 1080p to start. The hub will also support HDMI-connected consoles with pass-through support for both PlayStation and Xbox controllers, although they didn't say how that would work. Samsung announced the Galaxy S21 FE. The main differentiator from the standard S21 is RAM. The FE offers 6 gigabytes compared to the S21's 8 gigabytes. The S21 FE starts at 699 US dollars for 128 gigabytes of storage. Withings announced the Body Scan Smart Scale, which uses an extendable handle with electrodes that can measure ECG fat content, and water content in your arms, legs, and torso, as well as nerve activity. It'll ship in the U.S. and Europe in the second half of 2022, following FDA clearance, and it'll cost you 300 bucks. Little more Samsung news. The company announced an update to its solar-powered eco-remote, adding the ability for the remote to convert radio waves from a home router into energy. The 2022 Eco Remote will also come in white as well as the usual black and can be still charged over USB-C if necessary. AT&T announced the Fusion 5G phone running Android 11 with millimeter wave 5G and wireless charging for the low, low price of $219 going on sale Friday, January 7th. Phones at that price point usually only support sub 6 gigahertz 5G. CyberPower PC has a PC case with 18 mechanical vents that open and close automatically to better cool your rig. It reads PC temp sensors every five seconds. It'll show up first in CyberPower PC's Kinetic series of PCs later this year. I wasn't sure if we should include this next one, but you're worth it. L'Oreal announced the <laughs> ColorSonic hair coloring device that promises to deliver the correct amount of hair dye with a simple brush through your hair. No more spotting up the sink. You'll buy your hair color as a cartridge, <laughs> pop it in, and brush. Launching in test batches at the end of this year with widespread availability coming in 2023. No price yet. Never thought about printing my hair, but you know what? 
Sounds pretty good. TCL showed off the Next Wear Air. That's its second generation wearable display, which creates the appearance of a 140 inch display from about 13 feet away, connecting over USB C. Doesn't do any AR or VR, but now it's 30% lighter at 75 grams and looks more like regular sunglasses. It'll launch in Q1, although we don't have word on pricing. Panasonic's Shiftall announced a pair of Steam VR goggles that use 220 hertz micro OLED displays along with temperature altering accessories to add cooling and heating effects to your head. The Meganex headset weighs just 8.8 .8 ounces, but it does need to be tethered to a PC. That's part of the way they keep it so light. Coming this spring from about $900, they say. Shiftall also is going to sell leg and hip trackers for $270 this spring, a Bluetooth vest with that same temperature immersion, and a $200 voice-suppressing microphone called Mutok to keep the real-world sounds out of your virtual world and your virtual world sounds inside. HP's new Omen 45L desktop features a new cooling system using a cryo chamber with a cooling system radiator above the main case. The idea, of course, is that the chamber can pull in cooler ambient air from outside the main system, with HP claiming it can reduce CPU temps to uh, up to 6 degrees Celsius compared to systems without it. Hey. You know, you're cooling. The case is also uh, including a toolless front and side panels, so that's good for tinkerers. Pre-built systems will start at $1,900, US but HP, uh, HP rather also plans to sell the case with cryo chambers for system builders. Yeah, good omens. And Anchor announced the B600 Video Bar, a 2K-capable webcam that includes mics, a key light and speakers all in one. Onboard AI can also do some auto zoom and panning, lighting adjustments and noise cancellation. Launch on January 25th for 220 bucks. The self-flying drone company Skydio announced the Skydio 2 Plus. Everybody got to do a plus. Yeah. Offering the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio for a 6 kilometer maximum range, up to 70% from the Skydio uh, 70% above the Skydio 2. A bigger battery pack allows for 27 minutes of flight time at a time. The company also updated its self-piloting software with Keyframe, available on the 2 Plus and also the standard 2, letting users designate individual shots with the onboard camera and then letting the drone navigate between them in a sweeping video. If you're mm. interested, the Skydio 2 Plus starts at $1,099 available now all right we got tvs we got robots we got all kinds of other ces stuff to talk about all that chip stuff but let us start with the hottest newest trend in the world of technology sarah tell us what <laughs> at ces is in the web 3 category oh man you know ces is always a, a trailblazer for <clears throat> some sometimes vaporware sometimes real products but i i feel like this one is significant the blockchain entering the living room, everybody, because Netgear announced that it's adding NFT integration into its mural connected picture frame. Mural has already existed, but NFTs will now be part of this. After previously announcing that it would start beta testing integration between mural and MetaMask. If you're not familiar, MetaMask is a cryptocurrency wallet, and that is all slated to start later this month. Prices start at $300 and go up to about $600, depending on the size of the frame that you choose. Uh, in the same vein, Samsung announced a new sustainability project, which includes planting 2 million mangrove trees in Madagascar, uh, island off of Africa, over the next three months through a partnership with a company called Veritree. Veritree will help Samsung track progress of each tree that is planted Supposedly, this has nothing to do with TVs, but Veritree's system is built on a blockchain. And the whole idea is that tree planters can take, take stock in what they've planted, what others have planted, instead of needing an auditor to supervise project sites, to fly over and you know see how many trees are planted, etc. Samsung says it chose Madagascar because of the mangrove tree efficiencies in converting carbon dioxide to oxygen. So, kind of cool, but <laughs> this was my favorite one. Let's talk a little bit more about Samsung's NFT aggregation platform for... 
not all its TVs in 2022, but its micro LED and Neo Q LED TVs and also the frame models going forward into 2022. People can view and buy NFTs from their TVs. It's a it's an app, right? And those who already own NFTs can also use this as a bit of a picture frame to display their collections. Samsung says its smart calibration technology will also calibrate a TV to match the specifications of the NFT creator to ensure that the display is as the artist intended. Now, listen, if you think NFTs are silly from the beginning, then these products are going to seem silly. I think that just makes sense. But for those who are into NFTs, they're like, no, no, I like NFT my bored enthusiasts. ape. Uh, yeah, I, I I like owning a Len. May, I bought a Len Peralta NFT. Let's say like, hey, I want to display that. Then this yeah. starts to make sense, right? It's like, oh, and if Len said it's best displayed at this resolution and this brightness, then I can I can have that automatically happen. I'm not sure I'd buy a whole product just for that, but there's some NFT enthusiasts who absolutely will. Question, uh, Sarah, I know you and I were talking about this before the show, is what platforms is it going to support, right? Uh, yes. I'm sure they'll and, support some big ones or else Samsung wouldn't be making a big deal of this, but they haven't announced which ones yet. I mean, when Netgear said, okay, we got a picture frame, we want to, you know, include NFTs, we're, we're, we're working with MetaMask, which is a pretty big cryptocurrency platform app. That makes sense to me where I'm like, okay, well, if you choose to, you know, go that route, then all of a sudden you've got this big old picture frame in your house that can displays not display not only NFTs, but I don't know, uh, pictures from your last vacation and also works of art. That's like a subscription service that's sort of a little bit separate than this, but something that you could do. That's cool to me. When Samsung was like, ah, hold my beer, we can do this inside our TVs. I was like, okay, well, who are you partnering with? Yeah, and I details. don't have information about that. Yeah. Makes a difference. Patrick, what do you think? You know, I've been, it's a new year. I've been trying so hard to keep the snark to a minimum. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> uh, we talked about this uh, earlier on Good Day Internet. And I think it came down to is, as you pointed out, people who believe that they are on the ground floor of NFTs and this financial revolution that they're going to ride to the top and they're enthusiastic about it, or they just want to directly pay an artist. Um, are going to be enthusiastic about this. And for those of us who are maybe more cynical, people are like, well, we make displays. Those are designed to be displayed. And everybody's writing about NFTs. And this is a way we can stand out at CES. I mean, it's, there's a, you know. I, 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 honestly, it kind of makes sense. I'd be like, yeah, I'd probably do that too for them, right? If you could we're going to leverage our synergies, yeah. Tom. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I, you know, we, I don't mean to be a right clicker, uh, about this, but yeah, for some people, uh, just having a picture frame, right? Just the Samsung yeah. frame is enough. You're not going to need this, but if you're in the NFTs, you know, having it built in, it's easy enough. You just put the software in there. It's not like this is any different, right? Well, and I mean, there's so much, there's so much conversation that goes on between, and I include myself in the people that are like, I'm not participating, you know, can't you just right click and yeah, save the foot. Like, what does this really mean? And if you really think of it as it's close to the equivalent of buying like a, a, a very, very, uh, uh, a, a piece of art that would be sold at Sotheby's, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and you have it and it's yours and you're able to display it, uh, you know, on, on any level where like, sure, your friends come over and they're like, hmm, that's pretty cool nft you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> little thing you got going on like i see why that makes this make slightly more sense because you're kind of showing off something that you really care about i thought when i saw the netgear and samsung announcements so close together i'm like oh we might be seeing an nft trend at ces but i haven't seen anything since then mm, so we'll yeah. keep an eye on it uh what we are seeing a lot of is robots uh, here are a few catching people's eyes. Labrador Systems showing off a more developed version of the Retriever, a voice-controlled cart aimed at people with limited mobility and carry up to 25 pounds, has a retractable tray arm that can actually take objects off of counters and put them onto the cart or vice versa. Uh, there's an option for a built-in fridge in the cart so you can store some things in there. Automatically goes and recharges itself overnight, $1,500 down. 
and 36 monthly payments of $149 a month for the Retriever or $99 a month for the one without the fridge. That one's called the Caddy. Uh, full production is expected in the second half of 2023, if you're interested in these. There's also the new $5,149 Ecovax D-Bot X1 Omni, an attempt to finally make a decent robot vacuum that can also mop. Uh, the kick here is the docking station cleans the mop heads, empties the dustbin, and refills the water. That one comes in March. And in the broader robotic land of autonomous vehicles, which are kind of robots, Qualcomm announced its opening an engineering office in Berlin to support clients of its Snapdragon digital chassis for autonomous cars. Uh, Volvo, Volvo, Honda, and Renault all announced they are now among the around 40 OEMs using that platform. Too Simple uh, announced it's going to use NVIDIA stocks in its autonomous trucks. And Soul Robotics announced the first commercial deployment of a control tower for a fleet of autonomous vehicles at a BMW plant. The Level 5 control tower places LiDAR sensors, mostly LiDAR sensors, around the facility to control any car. They put the sensors in the facility, and then you can control any car with connectivity and an automatic transmission. The system is aimed at any business, like a trucking or rental car company, for example, that needs to move vehicles around a lot. And finally, John Deere announced the 8R Autonomous Tractor, six pairs of stereo cameras for object detection and GPS to maintain position. Supposedly, you can drive it to the start of your field, configure it for autonomous operation, and let it go. And then the farmers can monitor progress from a mobile device, which lets them adjust speed and drill depth remotely. The John Deere 8R is headed into large-scale production right now, and should be available later this year. Well, I don't own a farm. Um, so some of this is slightly lost on me as far as if I could, you know, put it into my own practice. But boy, will I take that mop vacuum hybrid. Do you think it'll work? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. So right now, I mean, I, I uh, for a live with it segment, uh, gosh. I don't know, probably about a year ago for DTNS listeners, I, I, I checked out one of the Roomba models. There, there are quite a few and still use it almost daily. Love it. The idea that it could somehow mop the areas that doesn't really clean that well because it's just a vacuum would be amazing. I don't know how that would work unless you were doing like some very significant, like, I don't know, AI mapping of the... Uh, overall area that you're trying to clean sense, it could probably sense the the floor that needed mopping but yeah, yeah also i I, I messed up the price it's a thousand five hundred forty nine still pricey but not as pricey as five thousand so i wanted that to was my big question was was wait is it really five that because they're no their, it's 1, their vacuums are yeah. five hundred eight hundred dollars uh ecovax so that was a that was a, a 10x factor i'm like wow it did better you know wash and wax and pet the floors <laughs> and sing to your cat and you know chase off people breaking <laughs> yeah. into your house it does empty the dustbin that's a that's a huge one although you have to empty the dustbin it empties the dustbin into at some point you I guess. that but there are others that empty uh, emptying yeah, the dustbin not, is like not you're right, you're right. like it's not it's not that the 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 idea that i could just be like hey i robot start roomba which is what i have to do mm -hmm. it's like a weird way that i have to talk to uh, alexa but um <laughs> But for that to be like, and I will also mop <laughs> while you're gone, I would just bow down in relief. I would like Soul Robotics to put that uh, commercial deployment control tower into valet parking. Can oh, you imagine? I mean, very most LA valet town. parking probably isn't large enough uh, to, to deal with this, but like valet parking at say a stadium or a mall, that kind of place where you could just have it, have your car, like you could on your app, say, send me the car. No people have to go get it. The car just is driven <laughs> to you. Gonna well, not make a public transportation joke here, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it really would not be that. CES if we didn't, you know, take uh, uh, technology to the bathroom. It's just what we do. It's what we do every year, everybody. That's true. So let's take a tour through some of the newest smart home products coming out at CES, starting with the bathroom. The Kohler Perfect Fill with Google and Amazon Voice can fill your tub to a preset level and temperature and also goes on sale in May for $2,700. Okay. Kohler also offers a, a version of its touchless faucet for the bathroom. 
$199, a little bit more uh, affordable. If you need to lock up medicine or, you know, really anything, <laughs> you need to lock up anything in your bathroom, the Rob the Rob Learn IQ Digital Lockbox, $449 can also be put into a bathroom. Moving on to the kitchen, Kohler offers the purest suspend ceiling mount kitchen faucet. You heard me right, folks. The faucet <laughs> is suspended from the ceiling. It's coming inside the house. It, it's of course, really hangs from the ceiling. <laughs> 180 degree rotating arm, controlled wirelessly with a puck like remote. Pretty cool but does cost $4,300 to up to $6,235, depending on what finish you're looking for. Moen offers a touchless kitchen faucet, uh, a staple at CES these days. Everybody loves a touchless kitchen faucet. However, this one adds hand-free temperature control, not just on and off, for $675. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if you're thinking... If you're if you're saying to yourself, well, you know, my bathroom, and my kitchen are like kind of fine. TP-Link announced a four Tapo branded smart cameras, two security sensors, and a home security hub coming to the U.S. later this year. And since we're talking about TP-Link, might as well mention routers, especially the Archer AXE 200 Omni and AXE uh, 11,000 routers that determine device location and Wi-Fi usage and automatically rotate antennas for the best performance. Come in the first half of this year. That's fun. Back to security, though. The Schlage Encode Plus Smart Wi-Fi Deadbolt is the first smart lock to announce support for Apple HomeKey. That's Apple's NFC door lock support. It's also Schlage's first thread-enabled lock. That is coming this spring as well for $300. Now, if you're heading out the door, Masonite's P Power, M Power, rather, which is M P W R smart door with ring doorbell and Yale Assure smart lock is also built in. Also integrates a Bluetooth PIR motion sensor and motion activated LED lighting going into a fiberglass door that connects to the home power system and Wi Fi. Has a 24 hour backup battery in case of power outage and also has its own built in smart hub. And everything is upgradable if you want to get a newer doorbell or smart lock down the road. You're already in the system. Launching for new homes, starting with the Bearing Homes in Charlotte, North Carolina. I know, I know. Deep breath, everybody. Finally, the roof. Everybody needs a good roof. GAF Energy's Timberline Solar Shingles that work just like regular shingles, but they're solar. You can nail them on and also overlap them uh, on your own roof. The cells are about 22.6% efficient, which is near the top end of the current panels. And a six kilowatt system takes up to mm, somewhere between 350 and 450 square feet, which is about the same as a larger panel. So I know the roof thing has got Patrick going. So before before I let let, let you loose on that, uh, that smart door is pretty cool. Like the idea that it's uh, you can you can get powered doors in commercial settings, but getting them in, in a home setting is is almost impossible. Uh, I know this is only for new home builds right now, but they're talking about making it available for renovators, which is a much bigger market. So to me, it feels like they're beta testing it with new homes to make sure they work out all the kinks. Uh, but that's interesting, especially because they they planned ahead and said, yeah, you want to swap out the doorbell, we'll make it so that you can do that. You're not stuck with the same ring doorbell for 10 years because your door is going to last you <laughs> a lot longer than than the uh, than the device cycle. But man, those solar those solar shingles look really really interesting. They're incredibly compelling because they it, mostly it's about the ease of installation, right? Because uh, and it's they're they're basically laid down like shingles. They don't require a whole team. You know, it's it's very similar to how you install shingles now. Um, I'm very, very curious to see what the cost is going to be. But if they can actually ship them in the sense of bring them to market, uh, those are incredibly compelling. Uh, as somebody who would like to put solar on the roof, you know, GAF, if you could just finish this before I have to re-roof my house, that would be killer. <laughs> um, but they also, I mean, it was one of the funny stories I read about this was like, you know, Tesla's got some company and it's like Tesla's barely installed any 
of their solar roofs and they're incredibly complicated. I think the number is like less than 2000. I I know at least personally three friends that have tried to get Tesla to install, you know, a couple of them are in Phoenix, uh, which is, you know, if there's a better place in a big open field in Phoenix to have a solar roof, I don't know where it is. Uh, and they just can't, they, they just, it's a mess. So it would be really cool to see this yeah. and the, the whole level of thought they've gone into these, uh, is really kind of fascinating. You could walk on them, which you can't do with the Tesla ones. Uh, Correct. It, it, it's a big deal. You, you, you nail them right into the roof. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and uh, they say that while they are the shingles themselves are more expensive than regular shingles, if you do a whole roof, they're like, we recommend this if you're redoing your whole roof. The total cost that you would pay to re-roof a regular house and install solar on a house with bigger panels is the same as re-roofing a house with part of them being these solar shingles. So that's kind of that's the sweet spot. really compelling. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> When you, I mean, it almost makes you want a new roof, which nobody really wants usually, <laughs> unless they have to. Well, I don't know. I'm also kind of fascinated by that whole uh, the Kohler Purist suspend ceiling mount kitchen faucet because I'm torn between being fascinated by the idea that my, you know, faucet, my tap is going to come from the ceiling and, <laughs> and I the, know. the plumbing that you have to run up the wall and across the ceiling and down the center of the room. Uh, and the wire, like what happens the first time somebody's drunk at a pie, you know, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of a mix between what a fascinating aesthetic, uh, conceit and, oh my goodness, did somebody hide the hockey puck? We need water. <laughs> oh, totally, <laughs> Where's the remote right? for the yeah. water? I mean, it does have an on and off switch on it. So you don't have to use the remote to use it, but yeah, that the hot, cold temp, et cetera. Uh, I can't wait to, to see a really expensive house that I, I go on an open house and see that installed. Uh, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, we got chips. Let's get into the chips. Uh, starting with AMD. AMD introduced Ryzen 6000 mobile CPUs built on the 6 nanometer Zen 3 Plus process. And here's the big part, including RDNA 2 graphics. So 1080p gaming from integrated graphics. They also integrate the new Microsoft Pluton security chip uh, and support Wi-Fi 6E, USB 4, PCIe Gen 4, and HDMI 2.1. AMD's claiming 1.3 times faster processing, twice the gaming performance, up 24 hours battery life. And like the 5000s, the 6000 series will come in an H series with 35 and 45 watt models, as well as a U series in 15 and 28 watt models for thin and lights. The first laptops with Ryzen 6000 are set to arrive in February. AMD also announced the Radeon RX 6000S range of GPUs for thin and light laptops. Those will go up to 100 frames per second, depending on the model coming throughout Q1. The entry-level RX 6500 XT gives you RDNA 2 graphics for 199 bucks. That one goes on sale January 19th. And AMD teased that the Ryzen 7000 desktop chips on the 5 nanometer Zen 4 process are going to arrive in the second half of 2022. Not much on those yet, but there will be an LGA design, so the pins on the motherboard instead of on the chips, and they are going to support PCIe 5 and DDR5. Patrick, uh, what do you make of the AMD stuff? I'm excited. Anything that means you know better battery life and, and better performance on laptops is a big deal. Mostly, I was just super, super thankful that that next generation 7000 series part is not coming now because i just upgraded to the top of the line 5000 series a few months <laughs> right. ago um yeah sorry if i'm being selfish there but uh you know everything sounds good uh boy it would have been nice to to have them say like hey we've stockpiled a whole bunch of cards and it'll be available everywhere but the truth is is compared to nvidia md's uh, gpu availability has been fairly high uh fairly spendy but I'm very curious to see what happens with that over the next six months. Right. We'll go ahead yep. and pre-approve you for the reaction to Intel and NVIDIA of, I won't be able to get these. I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> well, that, that was kind of the joke I was going to make as well. It's not really a joke, but, you know, I feel like there are a lot of people who go, great, sounds great. Companies have been working on technology. When can we get them? Yeah, you know, yeah. there's a supply Eventually. chain issue where, like, is this vaporware? Like, like, how long would I actually have to wait, even if I could spend the money? It hasn't been as bad on on desktop CPUs. It seems like laptop availability, and and I, I have not been following this religiously, but you know, if you want high end gaming graphics in a laptop, or in if you want high end gaming for 
graphics right now. The easiest way to get it is in a laptop. Availability has been fairly high, uh, both at the sort of more affordable end and the cost is no object end of things. Um, desktop processors were really bad last summer, but seem to be fairly available now. Um, the you know big question is still desktop CPUs or excuse me, desktop GPUs. Tom's going to address that a little bit uh, in the next two stories, so I won't get too far into that. Uh, AMD's had some availability. I think the biggest thing is affordable GPUs or GPUs that are remotely close to MSRP. That's been the real challenge, I think, yeah, for yeah. everyone at this point. Do you feel like uh, there'll be people who buy like an all-in-one laptop and just rip out the GPU and do something else with it? I wish they could. People wish they could. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's been interesting because I've seen everything from availability on Raspberry Pis to subwoofers to, you know, it's a lot of strange backups in different areas, you know, substrates for, for processors, um, the cost of copper. Like one of my favorite speakers basically went up 10% halfway through last year, went up another 20% at the beginning of 2022 in no small part because the the it's just become that much more expensive to get the copper for the windings in the coil and it's become more expensive to bid on the on the production time because a lot of these are being made from big you know manufacturers in, in china or wherever so it's 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 not as bad it's not anywhere near say 2019 at this point but it's closer to 2019 than it was halfway through 2020 was, yeah yeah 2021, uh, sorry. <laughs> keeping that in mind, Intel announced a lot of chips today. Uh, we'll start with one from Mobileye. It's an autonomous driving company, the IQ Ultra System on a Chip, built on a 5 nanometer process meant to have a, handle level 4 autonomy. That's self-driving under most conditions, not level 5, which is all conditions. Uh, cheaper, less power-hungry parts, so more affordable autonomy for consumers coming late 2023 with full production expected 2025. So the the upshot of this would be that you would get uh, more cars having more autonomous features at a lower price. Okay, on to the PC chips. Intel announced 28 12th gen mobile chips, uh, eight for gaming laptops, six in a new P series that emphasizes battery life, but at 28 watts to 64 watts. So kind of between the performance and the thin and lights. Uh, there's also 10 U series for thin and lights in nine and 15 watt versions and four for cheap laptops and Chromebooks and such. Intel claims the new 12th gen mobile processors are 40% faster than the previous gen. Models include memory support for DDR5 in some and DDR4 in others, Thunderbolt 4 and Wi-Fi 6E. The H series mobile 12th gen chips arrive in February and the P and the U series are coming by the end of March. Intel also announced 22 more 12th gen desktop processors. So 28 for the laptops and mobile, 22 for the desktop, uh, 65 watt and 35 watt versions. These new models are aimed at price and power requirements. Uh, so they're different than the previously announced gaming and creator-focused versions. If you're like, didn't they announce a bunch already? Yeah, that, that's where these slot in. Intel announced its 6 nanometer ARC discrete GPU, that's ARC, which will be made by TSMC. So speaking of fighting for getting re resources at the foundry, they're going to be yeah. fighting with Apple and others at TSMC. Uh, they'll support hardware, accelerated ray tracing, variable rate shading, and mesh shaders, and will use the same driver package as integrated GPUs. So updates to one will happen to all. Uh, a few other announcements. Intel's Evo platform, that's the one that does instant wake and fast charge, uh, added an intelligence uh, plat uh, requirement parameter, Pretty much means AI stuff like noise cancellation, Wi-Fi optimization, camera and, and imaging effects are now part of the Evo requirements. Intel announced commercial vPro equivalents of the 12th gen chips, uh, vPro Enterprise, as well as vPro Essentials, Essentials for companies without centralized IT departments. And Intel teased the KS version of desktop processors that it says will hit a boost frequency of 5.5 gigahertz, which would be a new high. Uh, that's just a tease, though, a lot more time before we get more details on that. What do you think of Intel's announcements, Patrick? You know, I think the biggest thing for me was hearing uh, that they were sampling parts, um, shipping Alchemist GPUs to OEMs, Acer, Asus, mm. Dell, Gigabyte, mm -hmm. HP, Lenovo, Samsung, uh, MSI desktop and laptop, which means they're, you know, I, I really want something in the light of fire under NVIDIA and uh, AMD. Um, Still no firm ship date on that. Um, I'm kind of very, very curious also about one of the things I saw, I think it was The Verge was writing about this, that discrete ARC GPUs are going to be required on all the Intel Evo branded laptops uh -huh. that use the 12th gen H series chips. And I'm like, ooh, 
you know, I'm, I'm torn between like, okay, they're going to make sure they've all got, you know, super awesome graphics performance, I hope. And, oh, I wonder what it's going to do. It'll be interesting to see whether or not, like the Evo, like so many other Intel branded things, it's part of a larger advertising campaign. In, in theory, it sets a certain technological standard of performance across a you know group of laptop subsystems, but reality is, is vendors mm-hmm. buy into it because there's ad money there, or at least that's the that's the carrot, not the stick. Um, kind of really curious to see how that turns out. Um, you know, I'm also really want to see those. Uh, I really want to see the Alchemist uh, numbers on those Alchemist GPUs. I'm very very curious about that, like a whole lot of other people. Um, you know, Intel bought a ton of of memory last year in anticipation of building it into GPUs. So curious to see when that finally ships and what the numbers look like when it does. All right. The third of our triple play of chip announcements on this like multiple CESs in one day CES day. NVIDIA teased a new flagship called the 3090 Ti. It will be roughly the same as the 3090, but with TI at the end, but also faster memory, 21 gigabits per second, uh, slightly higher specs in shader, tensor, and and uh, other teraflops. And Gadget calls it a 12.5% increase across the board. Video is going to save details for another announcement later this month on that. Uh, also announced the RTX 3070 Ti and 3080 Ti with 1440p gaming at 100 and 120 frames per second, respectively. Uh, the 3070 and 3080 Ti's are coming to laptops February 1st. The Max Q platform is supposedly going to be able to control CPU performance now, uh, power and temp as needed. NVIDIA says it worked with both Intel and AMD on this for their next-gen CPUs. And the RTX 3050 with ray tracing and DLSS coming to January 27th for $250. A few other tidbits. NVIDIA pushing eSports to upgrade to 1440p, claiming the equipment can now handle it without affecting frame weight. Uh, Certified its own GPUs in four third-party displays as part of that push. And NVIDIA brought Omniverse out of beta. Omniverse is that platform that uh, brings first and third-party tools together for designing virtual worlds. Quick thoughts on NVIDIA, Patrick. Uh, This is a really interesting... uh... You know, they they tease a new top of the line car that's going to require its own power plant. I kid slightly, um, but you know the 3090 Ti is fascinating. The 3050, the RTX 3050, people are really enthusiastic about. Um, you know, when you read the PR or the press release for this, it's kind of a cell phone. Three of the top five GPUs on Steam are GTX 50 class, including the 1050, which came out in. 2016 um and part of that's because boy people have been trying to buy 2000 series and 3000 series cards and can't um so in theory this is a 249 dollars car that will be available for nvidia partners there's no founders version of this you know will it be available at 249 will they have volume is it built on a different process that allows them to get access do they have substrates for it will they um you know the and it's it's a it's an interesting looking card when you look at the way they demonstrate it, they're not talking about CUDA cores. They're not talking about specs other than the amount of memory in there, but they literally showed benchmarks of it versus the 1050, the 1050i and the GTX 1650, um, which are great 1080p gaming cards. But uh, you know, it's uh, it is, it is curious to see them show the benchmarks on this and with, with them basically saying it's faster than older cars with slower technology. You know, uh, part of me is, is like, you know, okay, yes, this could be the perfect, sure you know, our ray traced yeah. Minecraft card for yeah. my youngest. Like he could really get into this. Uh, but this is, I feel like NVIDIA is at this position where they desperately would like people to stop nagging them about GPU availability. They desperately want to be able to fill, uh, you know, the channels. And they're probably really tired of people whining at them, myself included. Not that they really notice me amidst the noise, but they're 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 desperate to sort of like, you know, produce parts. And again, we, you know, we'll see what happens. Like, Love the concept, uh, especially given what I've seen some really old cards or some really old chips going for it at, at, uh, uh, online and at my local micro center. We'll see if they can actually ship these. And I hope, I really hope they do. Fingers crossed. Frost. All right. Well, it wouldn't be CES without TVs, Sarah. What do we got? <laughs> Indeed. And Robert Heron, uh, Patrick's co host on AVXL, by the way, is going to be with us on Friday to give us a much more con comprehensive view of what he thinks is going on with TVs this year at CES because this is what what Robert Heron does. But 
We have no we have noticed some notable ones so far. Starting with Sony, which announced the first quantum dot OLED 4K TVs with better brightness and more consistent color. Sony is using Samsung, not LG, but Samsung to supply these panels. QD OLED emits blue light through quantum dots for doing red and green without the need for color filter that standard OLED uses. So in theory, it's just a better process. That's better for brightness as well. Look for the Bravia XR A95K with Google TV coming later this year. That's from Sony. Sony also added the Bravia Cam to its A95K and Z9K models that can adjust brightness and voice emphasis and sound balance based on your viewing distance and your location and your direction. Samsung has a few firsts as well, announcing the first 4K and 8K Neo QLED sets with 144 hertz inputs instead of the usual 120 hertz. (laughs) They also go from 12-bit to 14-bit backlights, if that's your bag. Panasonic, not just Samsung, but Panasonic focused on gamers with its LZ2000 line, promising 60 hertz HDMI 2.1 auto detection of uh, NVIDIA's GPUs, and easier game settings overall. It's now available in 77 inches alongside 55 and 65 inch versions as well, coming this summer. LG also announced a 97 inch, but also a 42 inch OLED. So (laughs) kind of the largest and the smallest all in one. But, but if you want the largest TV you can get for your hard-earned dollars. TCL announced a 98-inch 4K QLED TV for less than $8,000. I mean, that sounds like a lot, but I guess other 98-inch 4K QLED TVs go for more, (laughs) so it's a bargain. I know. Look at you, TCL, just bringing it down to the people. I mean, I can't, I cannot imagine having a TV. I I would need to be so far back just because my eyes, everybody's different. But the idea that this is actually getting under like, it's like we're like sub 10K at this point tells me that there, there is a market for large scale TVs that previously, I don't know who, who would buy There's a lot of projectors out there. Sure. That's true. you know, I, I I ended up with my first 100-inch, or I guess I started with a 90-inch projection screen, moved up to a 100-inch projection screen because I could buy a projector and a screen for vastly less than a 65-inch television, like this is eight, nine years ago now. Um, so in, in some senses, you can get a 100-inch, 110-inch projection screen and a projector for vastly less money. You can't get the sure. 4K performance. Uh, that you can get out of the top of the line. What do you, this is a, this is a great question. Actually, I, I have as somebody who like kind of sometimes thinks about projectors, but like not really. What is so great? Like what is the obvious benefit of the projector mobility? No, I mean, for some people, right. Uh, for me, it's having that big hundred inch screen i mean you know we only sit like 11 or 12 feet from the screen but it's like being in a movie theater in the sense you have this big massive theatrical experience and for yeah. us that was just huge and you know it turns out cartoons are great in a theatrical experience and games are great when you have that big wide theatrical experience um he said over and over again i you know for for my it, it was funny because like i was really into it and it wasn't until i think a, a blu-ray version of um Sense and Sib- Sensibility, the BBC miniseries came out, mm. and my wife was looking at the screen. Was like the colors were really good. She could see all of this detail, and she was like, "Oh my goodness!" And she walks up to the screen. And she's looking so like this is amazing. And she sits back down, and we go back to you know enjoying uh, the witticisms that that make up uh, Jane Austen's work. Nice. <laughs> do 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 um when you have a projection, can you kind mm-hmm. of uh, screw with it for people's eyes more than you would be able to a TV? When, in what sense do you mean? What, what like are you focus? trying to Well, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like where I'm like, oh, I'm too close. Like, let me calibrate this a little bit so that it's a little bit farther away. Well, I mean, you can, you can set up, depending on the, depending on the projection system, you know, mine will, will move. There's a, it, the, depending on the lens system in the projector, you can put it anywhere from a few feet away to many, many more feet away from the lens on the projector. And that varies a lot with the, with the model and the manufacturer. Um, Got it. So, 
you know, do you have uh, how close are you currently, or what's your your minimum distance for for watching? Uh, it's about six feet. <laughs> so two Otis's. Yeah. Yeah. I got a fifty-five. A like, I mean, I'd love a sixty-five inch television, but I have no business. I just I can't get far enough uh, back because well, I'm far sighted. So there's an idea called like the I think I want to call it the Kell factor, but the idea is that as the resolution goes up, you can more comfortably sit close to it. And one of the arguments is that by the time you get to 4K, you should be sitting like two feet from the monitor. Now, obviously, you're having you know uh, tennis match face, sure. but you know once you get about but it's not so much that your eyes can't adjust. Yeah. they can adjust if it's a high enough resolution. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's also it's a very personal thing because I know I, I I still remember sitting the last time I sat in the movie theater when I was like six feet, six feet. I was like in the second row. I was probably 12 feet from this 40 foot screen. And it was just a miserable experience because, you know, you're laying down in your back yeah. you're trying to see the whole yeah. thing, your head swinging back. But you can probably a discussion for after the show, but we can talk about like what the rated or the recommended distances are for certain screen sizes. Uh, for me, it's like can I see the entire screen without having to shift my head around? And at six feet, you know, I think, you know, if you could, you could probably get a 65 inch screen in there, a hundred inch screen at six feet would probably drive you insane <laughs> with your pan and scan mode of looking around mm -hmm. the screen to, to follow the action. Uh, well, folks, we know, we, oh, go ahead. We, Tom. we hear, we hear a daily tech news show, Sarah. I just wanted to let the people know are, are trying to fight tennis match face. And there's, there's one way to help us with that fight. It's to back us on Patreon. Indeed. Uh, we would like to thank some brand new bosses that we got over the holidays. Uh, you know, Daily Tech News Show and certainly Daily Tech Headlines were, were churning through, but we got a lot of new patrons and we want to celebrate you now. Nian Yu, Water Ellie, uh, Walter Ellie rather, Glenn Gould, Anarchy Sun, Michael Monaco, Aaron Spinelli, Carrie Tran, Stephen, Chris Allen, and Cindy Siebert all just started backing us on Patreon. So we want to give a big, big thanks to Nian Yu, Walter, Glenn, Anarchy Sun, <laughs> Michael, Aaron, Gary, Stephen, Chris, and Cindy. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah, it's nice to be in 2022 with all y'all. Um, you too, Patrick Norton. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. I know you're busy with CES this week, but uh, but, <laughs> but but uh, people can follow along. Uh, best place to follow me right now is to uh, twitter.com slash Patrick Norton or to listen to AVXL, the home theater and audio podcast I record with Mr. Robert Heron, who will be joining you later this week. Indeed, he will. Well, we're so glad to have you on the show today. And reminder, folks, we are, you know, it's 2022. It's January and we are back in business live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're going to be back tomorrow with not only Scott Johnson, but also Nate Langson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>